Good evening. Welcome to the University of Sydney, Sydney Ideas Forum on the, on the Greek crisis. My name is Jeffrey Regal, and I'm the head of the School of Languages and Cultures in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the university. Uh, I'd like to extend our uh, warm welcome to all of you. It's gratifying that so many people have, have come to this evening's event, and I'd like to uh, extend a special welcome to His Excellency, the Consul General for Greece in Sydney, Mr. Vasilios Tolios. Welcome. <clears throat> Our school, the School of Languages and Cultures, is home to a number of departments, including our Department of Modern Greek Studies. Uh, our departments specialize in teaching and conducting research in the area of language, culture, and society. Let me begin with uh, a few uh, housekeeping items. First, uh, this evening's forum is the first of the university's uh, Sydney Ideas events in this city venue. If you've followed the, the Sydney Ideas program, you, you know that most often our events are at the university in the new law faculty. But it's really quite wonderful that we still hold on to this building and uh, its location allows us to make contact then with, with people for whom it's not always convenient to make the, uh, uh, to make the journey out to the university. So uh, it's, I, I think it's marvelous that we're getting in, in effect to inaugurate this series with, uh, with this evening's program at this, uh, at this venue. Uh, the city forums, uh, of which this is the first, are an initiative of the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences. And the, that division uh, uh, is made up of the three faculties that are listed. Uh, this, is, this is also a publicity event. The three faculties that are listed there, and those are the faculties of arts and so, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, uh, the Faculty of Education and Social Work, and the, um, uh, and the Sydney Law School. We hope to um, uh, present more of these forums in which these three faculties are uh, working together, showcasing University of Sydney experts from a range of disciplines within these faculties in conversation with others in our community. This is, of course, the model for this evening's event. The format for this evening is a panel discussion and the panel discussion will be followed by an opportunity for questions and answers. We have a handheld microphone that will pass around uh, for, the, for the question and answer part so that you can put your questions to the panel after the discussion. We're recording the event tonight for podcast and video on the university's website. And tonight, ABC Radio are here, and they are also recording this event. So we ask you to use the microphone so that we can capture, for posterity, your questions. As the Greek crisis thickens, I think you'll agree that we need responsible answers that go beyond the chauvinism and hysteria of journalism. Providing responsible answers that reflect a deeper understanding of Greece, Greek history, and the financial and government challenges the, co the country presently faces is the main purpose of this evening's event. Since 2010, Greece has dominated the attention of world media. Characterized by some as the lazy slacker of the European Union, and by others as a country struggling heroically to find its position in the modern globalized world, fighting against monopolies and international conspiracies. For the last three years, newspapers have been unable to make sense of the Greek case. Certainly, that's the impression one gets when one looks at the headlines. What they ask do the Greeks want? Their confused answer suggests that the Greeks want both to continue with their joie de vivre attitude and to work hard for the future. Voices outside of the media are more sympathetic and more supportive. The French director, Jean-Luc Godard, refused to submit his latest film to the Cannes Film Festival because of the way Europe has treated, in his words, the birthplace of its culture. 
Nobel Prize winning German writer Gunter Grass published a Philhellenic poem entitled Europe's Shame, in which he deplored the way that Europe has reduced Greece to a country without rights, a debtor placed naked on the pillory, taxed on scrap value. Those are Gunter Grass's words. The dichotomy in European and world public opinion is apparent and runs deep. It reflects a polarization that demonstrates how simplistically the issue has been presented. The recent Greek elections show a strange ambivalence in the Greeks themselves. They voted overwhelmingly for left-wing and right-wing radical and extremist parties, which seem to question the country's position in Europe itself. To get to the truth, we need to move beyond such dichotomies and polarization and the biased slogans that have issued from them. The School of Languages and Cultures, through its Modern Greek Studies Department, in collaboration with Sydney Ideas Public Lectures, the Forums Program, have organized this evening's event to sketch the parameters of the Greek crisis, explore its possible solutions, and express the Australian view on, an uncreced on unprecedented events that threaten to destroy the noble post-war dream of a unified Europe, not to mention our investments and superannuation funds. In order to suggest some answers together, uh, we have with us tonight uh, a distinguished panel of participants. First, I'll reintroduce His Excellency, the Consul General for Greece in Sydney, Mr. Vasilios Tolios. <clears throat> Next, the Right Honorable Federal Member for Caldwell, Ms. Maria Bamvakinos. <clears throat> the Honorable Ms. Sophie Kotsis, Labor Member for the New South Wales Upper House. <clears throat> Our colleague from the Economics School at the University of Sydney, Professor Tony Aspromorgos. <clears throat> And finally, my colleague within the school, Associate Professor Vrasidas Karalis of our Modern Greek Studies Department. And Vras will be chairing this evening's forum. And I turn the program over to his capable hands. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> um, is it clear now? Can we hear them? First of all, I would like to thank Sydney Ideas for organizing this, especially Meredith, who is, uh, was behind the whole thing, and she in, encourages to go on with this, proje with this project. I would like to thank uh, Professor Riegel for being here tonight. He has been so supportive of Greek studies that I feel honored to be with him and working with him, with him in the promotion of Greek culture and Greek, um, um, about Greek issues in Australia, and especially around the University of Sydney. And I'd like to thank all our participants tonight because all of them represent different uh, aspects of, uh, of this question. They will give us different aspects of the question and uh, um, I will simply ask them questions. And if you want at the end, we'll have the format as Professor Riegel said is, each one of them will give us an answer to the question, and then at the end, we'll have, a, uh, in, in 45 minutes to 50 minutes from now, we will have a Q&A with you. Um, our Consul General has to leave at a certain stage, as Maria, because, as you know, she's from interstate, and they have so many th interesting things to decide in Canberra, don't you think? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many demands. <laughs> so, can I ask first uh, to make the first question, because I think that uh, Professor Tony Aspromurgos is probably the most, uh, uh, sort of a kind, if I may say, capable of answering, uh, of giving some ideas about the complexity of the financial situation in Greece. Tony. What do you think? Uh, can I uh, use this podium or? It's better like you, you, can, you are. Can you all hear yeah. me? Yeah, okay, good. Well, I wanted to make some uh, preliminary comments to give a sense of for five minutes or so, if I'm allowed so much time. Uh, Only five though. To make some comments about uh, what I think is the broad character of uh, the economic situation. Uh, I think uh, the crisis of the euro currency area and perhaps even of the larger European Union as well, 
appears first and foremost as an economic crisis, though it could be said that the economic crisis into which the Eurozone has descended merely serves to expose a deeper problem of political governance and of the political and economic architecture of both the Eurozone and the European Union. Greece has been the trigger or catalyst for this larger crisis, focusing attention on the problems of economic organisation, economic performance and political governance there. But on the face of it, it seems right to doubt that Greece could really be the major culprit in the crisis, given it is economically such a small part of the Eurozone and of the Union. The situation of Europe and of Greece in Europe, as they have developed to the point we are, we are at now, is immensely complex and has many dimensions. But I'd like to try to summarise what seem to me the fundamental economic issues. The crisis of the emergence of the unsustainable Greek public debt levels is a story about surpluses and deficits in the Eurozone and the incapacity of Eurozone economic organisation and political governance to resolve those imbalances. Here, one must keep firmly in mind that for the world as a whole, financial deficits and surpluses of the various national economies must add up to zero. There cannot be countries running surpluses unless there are other countries running deficits and vice versa. In short, it takes two to tango. Greece was able to run deficits for years before 2010 and finance these deficits with debt because others in Europe who were running surpluses were prepared to channel funds to Greece. And they were prepared to do so at interest rates barely above yields on German government debt, implying that Greek debt was barely more risky than German debt. What did they not know about the difference between Greece and Germany that the rest of us knew? The incapacity of the Eurozone to successfully deal with imbalances, with surpluses and deficits among the member economies before the crisis arose is a large part of the explanation for why Greece was able to work its way into the financial hole it ended up in. The inexorable brute logic of surpluses and deficits adding up to zero is also a useful entry point for seeing why the current solution to the crisis, championed by the German government and the German policy elite, is almost certain to be a disastrous failure if it is not to be so regarded already, or an even bigger disaster and failure than it is now. The surpluses and deficits of nation states for the world as a whole must add up to zero. The same is true if we further decompose each national economy into its public sector and private sector. Then we can say that the public sectors of all those national economies taken together cannot be in surplus unless the private sectors of all those national economies taken together are in deficit. The relevance of this point is that in the wake of the financial crisis, the private sectors of the affected economies have been cutting back on spending to reduce their debt levels and more generally strengthen their balance sheets. This has then been followed on in Europe by a policy push for public sectors to cut back spending, to reduce their debt levels as well. But it is near impossible for all sectors in Europe, public sectors and private sectors, to move towards surplus simultaneously. It's only possible if the rest of the world beyond Europe is prepared to run a substantial deficit with Europe. In the process of all this cutting back, and attempted debt reduction and deleveraging, 
the overall levels of aggregate demand and economic activity are weakened. Apart from the socio-economic damage this causes, it compromises the attempted public sector debt reduction by eroding the tax base and putting upward pressure on some areas of spending, so turning out to be self-defeating. Why then do the German policy makers, as well as others in Europe, pursue this path? I could answer this question, but I'll leave it. <laughs> Take notes, eh? Take notes, you know, for the end, you know. You said everything. Can I ask Your Excellency, Mr. Tolius, what do you think about the position of Greece within the European Union after joining the Eurozone? Was it a successful, you know, if I may say, amalgamation, joining this um, sort of a, the, the club of big economies, successful and northern European mostly economies, based on industry, based on surpluses or very strict austerity policies in the country? For example, Germany, they haven't seen a pay rise for the last 10 years. Eh? Do you think that Greeks, Greece, Greece's position was in any way symmetrical with what was happening in the rest of Europe? Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for, uh, for this uh, event, very important event. I would like to congratulate Sydney University and uh, Sydney Ideas. Uh, I hope we will end up with Greek ideas also <laughs> <laughs> after <laughs> uh, closing this uh, very, very important uh, discussion. Um, I would... Um, confidently may say that, of course, the accession of Greece to the Eurozone was, uh, it may be profiled as a success story. Uh, it was uh, a successful outcome of uh, efforts, and uh, uh, I think um, Greece deservingly so joined uh, the Eurozone. Uh, of course, there were, on the occasion of this crisis, some voices also putting in doubt this um, let's say, a success story of acceding to the Eurozone, but of course it is always the case of dissenting voices uh, about, uh, on, on many events in our life, and it is uh, more than normal to hear different opinions in this. But in general, we may say uh, easily that um, undoubtedly it was a success story, and uh, I think um, uh, the Greek people uh, never put uh, uh, this issue under um, any kind of, uh, of questioning if it was correct or not, uh, this uh, uh, moving in of Greece in, uh, in a broader context of a common currency. Uh, of course, um, I think uh, I have to, to add uh, to this that um, uh, at this uh, stage, at that stage, and perhaps later on, we didn't realize, perhaps all of us, all the players of, uh, of, of this uh, common currency, that having something common in terms of currency, of course, it's a technical detail, but it's an important detail. And uh, everything else being separate, having 17 ministers of finance, um, it was something, uh, as a whole, uh, not um, uh, that uh, reasonable to, 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 to sustain even crisis of, of a bigger uh, uh, effect like uh, uh, that of uh, Lehman Brothers of 2008. So the whole vehicle of uh, the Eurozone economy uh, was heading uh, after this uh, big challenge of uh, uh, worldwide crisis that uh, saddened everybody, was heading to a di direction that was not so well known by everybody responsible um, uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this effort, this, this very important effort, but uh, uh, also politically very important uh, common effort of belonging together. Uh, being uh, with the same currency in, in, with um, uh, 17 countries, it's not uh, just uh, uh, getting together economically. It has uh, very, very important uh, political dimensions. 
Um, Europe um, is uh, in dire need and uh, always historically there was this necessity to find the ways and the means and if you wish even the pretexts to, of getting together. And of course this was a very substantial way of getting together uh, also as uh, a preemptive also diplomacy in, uh, of the European continent. Uh, if you see the map, we are uh, uh, a very small, let's say, uh, European-sized country, but uh, if separated, there are so many borders there. So we should find some common denominators of substance also uh, to get together. And uh, we started with the currency. Perhaps we didn't realize sufficiently enough that uh, this was not the end of the process and actually that it was a process that just started and we should end it somewhere beyond. And uh, of course this remark is more or less a political. Uh, we waited for a major crisis to erupt uh, in order to understand that uh, having something in common in terms of monetary dimension does not uh, suffice of remaining together when uh, major challenges arise. So this is my first, uh, my first general comment of, if you wish, of a mixed political economic nature. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Maria, you just came back from Greece. Huh? Okay. Now, can I become the devil's advocate and ask you, did you see a European country there? Did you see, did you think of, <laughs> You know, you are the Greek of a diaspora, and you live, uh, you know, you are transcultural. Mm -hmm. You know, you are the exponent and the advocate of multiculturalism. Okay, I'll tell you what I did see. Um, yeah. I did see a European country, but I saw a Europe that is struggling, um, especially through Greece, struggling with the massive influx of the poverty of the third world that is... Um, um, and in Greece itself, for some time I've been interested in the hundreds and thousands of uh, illegal or, or, or economic refugees, because that's ultimately what they are, uh, who, have, who find their way into Greece in the hope that they'll get to Europe. And uh, Greece at the moment, and especially its two major cities in particular, is, is inundated with hundreds and thousands of people who are fleeing poverty. And um, the European... Union itself, Europe, possibly even the United Nations, has absolutely not realised the extent of third world poverty uh, moving into the developed world and how it is going to be dealt with and absorbed. So one of Greece's major problems is this, and it's something that doesn't get spoken about, but it is one of the reasons why the Golden Dawn Party managed to elect 21 members of parliament um, I was in Greece a week out of the election. I spent three days in the Peloponnese where um, the uh, illegal uh, immigrants who actually come into Greece from up north um, are, are gainfully employed by local producers because they need them. They need that labour and without them they can't move agricultural products. So there is a purpose for, for them in the regions but not, not so in the cities. So... Um, the Golden Dawn Party ran exclusively on um, uh, the, the racial undertones of, uh, you know, uh, get these people out of our country. And that is a, a, an issue that has been festering in Greece and in Europe for some time, and it is something that Europe itself has failed to acknowledge. While I was there on the Monday, which is the day before May Day, the very first detention centre opened in Greece because Greece has now moved to adopting a mandatory detention system. Of course, it has absolutely no hope whatsoever of implementing a detention system because it just cannot detain hundreds and thousands of people. They are predominantly men from Pakistan and Bangladesh, and they are citizens of two countries, and in particular one, Pakistan, who is failing to look after the social needs of its people and they are pouring into other countries and they're becoming the responsibility of other countries. And there's no narrative internationally, anywhere, not even in the United Nations, there's no narrative 
about dealing with this issue for what it is and, and bringing some of these countries into account. So that's a, I raise it because it is an issue and it doesn't get raised uh, in the context of what's going on in, in Greece and in Europe. Now, of course, Greece is a European country. Um, do the Greeks want to get out of Europe, the Eurozone? The answer to that is no, they do not. Uh, do the Greeks know what they want? Uh, most of them, um, in that week up to the election, um, didn't know what was going to happen. In fact, they asked people like me if I knew what was going to happen. They were going to be voting, but they were asking what I thought as an outsider. Um, and there was a certain sadness in that because I've been in Greece during election periods and they're on the streets and everyone's fighting for their particular political party. Um, you wouldn't have known necessarily there was an election in Greece unless you were watching television. Um, and of course the impact, the immediate impact, impact of the uh, austerity measures um, and the situation in Greece is the unemployment rate. And there are some one million people unemployed in Athens alone, and you will see that immediately when you get out of the airport and travel the roads, because the streets and the road network of Greece is relatively light. It's a city that's choked with cars, and it's obvious that um, petrol is very expensive and people are not moving because they don't have employment. So they're the immediate impacts. Um, the Greeks are suffering from huge, huge disillusionment in the major political parties. Um, so much so that it's not a healthy attitude for a nation of people that have very strong views politically. Um, so they've opted for the left, uh, the charismatic um, citizen, uh, Tsipras, who's extremely charismatic and a uh, very eloquent speaker, says all the right things. Um, and then, of course, the, the uh, enduring Communist Party leader, and on the other side, you've got the Golden Dawn, the fascists. Um, and the two middle parties are under New Democracy and Papandreou's, um, not Papandreou, um, PASOK, Venizelos uh, now, um, completely annihilated in the public mind. Um, and that too is a problem in Greece because there's no balance, there's, there's extremities, and people are genuinely struggling to come to an understanding of where they're at. They have views about why they're there, and um, so you get to, uh, if you watch television, and they all do, you get the week that I was there, it was the lawyers week, that is lawyers who have been found to be very, very asset rich, millions of dollars worth of assets, but who declare poultry 40,000 euro incomes. And, uh, and the doctors were there before, it was the lawyers week this week, so they're doing quite a bit of that exposure and the famous swimming pools and so forth. But what I found interesting, and I'll end on this and come back to it, was the attitude of the Greek people on the street. And uh, they're becoming almost... Um, the actual austerity measures and the pursuit of the tax evaders is driving a sense amongst people of, I pay and I'm not going to let you get away with it. So when you sit in a coffee shop, um, which I did, you insist on getting the bill uh, maybe in the past it wouldn't have mattered, but now it does because you are being charged the GST and unless you get that bill back, the coffee shop owner in this case would be double dipping, ripping you off as well as the government. Now, there's a lot of that kind of attitude in Greece, which to me is new. I hadn't picked this up before. Um, and, of course, the Greeks are very concerned about the way the international community views them. And we are very concerned here, who are members of a very large, successful Greek community and have been, and I have been for a long time concerned since this happened, that uh, it's too easy to call Greeks lazy and corrupt. Um, that's not exactly the truth. And uh, this is a highly educated society. They are very highly educated. And the impacts... Um, on, on Europe and the effect it'll have on Australia is yet to be played out. And it isn't just whether it affects us because we're exposed to, Greek, to, to European banks. It's also about our entire migration set up here and what the communities here might be doing or Australia might be doing to actually assist with migration. We'll and I'll leave it at that, yeah.
Now, Sophie, can I ask you something? I mean, having heard all these things about what is happening in Greece at the moment and the rise of the extreme right wing, the essentially not fascist but Nazi party, you know, and, uh, the, and it's a Nazi party in the Greek, in, uh, and voted by youngsters eh, mostly and uh, by the police force and the army. What sort of political messages? You came from, come from a party that suffered a, a, a gray or a stunning electoral defeat last year, as you remember. And we voted for you, of course. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> we're feeling it. <laughs> we're feeling it, yeah. What do you think about this? Um, uh, you know, what sort of political messages you actually Greece sends to the outside world, to Europe and to us in Australia here? Look, I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm very concerned about um, what is happening in terms of the, the, the social aspect um, and how this is driving the extreme parties um, in getting support from young people, from educated people, um, and it is extremely concerning because the rhetoric that they're using um, to be able to get the support, and I was astounded that the um, Golden Dawn, uh, the Chrissy Avye, were able to get 7% um, of the vote, the 21 seats, as Maria indicated. Uh, I was watching a program, I think it was on Late Line a little while back, and they had one of the MPs um, who was uh, elected under the banner of Golden Dawn. And he was a young guy, he was a, a, a young family man, he had his own business, and he said, I, I want all the immigrants out today, I want them out, they've destroyed our country, um, and, and this is what's happening at that local level, at the coalface. And they are, every, everybody's under pressure because they're um, feeling, you know, the cheap labour that um, they're getting undercut, and their uh, standard of living is falling below what their expectations are. And that is a real concern um, for all of us because um, we've heard this rhetoric before. Um, we've, we've seen what's happened when this rhetoric um, has been uh, um, played upon. Um, and a couple of days ago, one of my colleagues, um, Walt Secord and myself, uh, put out a, a public statement. Uh, Walt Secord is the Deputy Chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Israel and myself put out a public statement um, against opposing um, this group um, because they also they made uh, an intention that they were going to start up branches in Australia. And they have made that public and they did state this on this program. Uh, some of the language that they use, the extreme language that they're using is... Um, uh, very serious and concerning, and sure, I understand. You know, we're in a democracy, and but um, this is the stuff that we haven't seen for a very long time. And we experienced um, in '96 when we had Pauline Hanson um, when she got up, and then the rhetoric that that she used, and she was allowed. Um, the government at the time, John Howard, allowed her, gave her a platform, and allowed her to get away with that. And then in um, Queensland, uh, I think it was in 2001 or one of those elections after Pauline Hanson, um, the Queensland Parliament uh, had over 10... Uh, Pauline Hanson's party had won about 10 seats. Now, um, they exploit the vulnerabilities and the weaknesses of the people at the time. And, um, I mean, what did her... In the election afterwards, Pauline Hanson got wiped out. I mean, her party in Queensland got wiped out. So um, it, is, uh, it is concerning. And, and what happened to us, as you said, Professor, um, last year, is um, that people, people want to see political leaders and political parties that have ideas that are representative of the people and ensure that by being representative that they are being responsive to their needs. They look forward, they have the vision to ensure that there is the economic growth, that there is um, the thinking ahead so that people don't have to suffer what is currently, what they're suffering now. And then you get these social, um, uh, these problems where the, the, the desperation of unemployment of one in four young people in Greece are unemployed. I mean. My concern is I don't want to see a brain drain. I don't want to see all these smart young people, these, these Greeks having to leave their country, leave Greece, um, because they can't get a job. And that's a concern, and this is where these extreme parties are exploiting 
um, those vulnerabilities. Well, it's ex it's, it is already happening, I have to tell you. Last Friday, yeah. I had four people in my office at the university, one of them a dentist, another one an astrophysicist, and asking for help. I said, now, listen, I am a, a poor language teacher, underpaid, as a matter of fact, you know, just what can I do? But beyond the diagnosis, can I we now look at the future? Let's extrapolate the future. Professor uh, Tony, you talked about these problems that we have economically in the European Union. What do you think that Greece, what is the economic strength of Greece, that Greece can bring some uh, sort of a kind itself to become a productive economy? And how, what in what Greeks can uh, contribute to this um, booming economies of Northern European, so we, uh, of, of Europe, so we can have some surpluses as well, because we have a member of, of a federal government here. <coughs> they are fighting for surpluses for the last 10 years, as we know, right? I think that, um, I think that uh, Greece, uh, given the economic circumstances of the Eurozone and the European Union, uh, is going to be overwhelmed by forces that are beyond its control and beyond any amount of energy or hard work or discipline that uh, the Greek people in Greece could possibly bring to it. The fact is that, that uh, Greece finds itself in a monetary union in which it does not have available to it uh, even the first step of an Argentinian solution, which is a depreciation of the currency. Uh, I quote the Spanish cartoonist who, set, who made the point, if we cannot devalue the currency, then we will devalue the people. Uh, this is the alternative. In a, in a situation where most of Europe uh, is in deflationary mode, the European economy is contracting, including the United Kingdom. In this situation, how could uh, Greece possibly, in the manner of a business that is uh, bankrupt, how could it possibly trade out of its problems? It is, it is, simply, it is uh, simply asking uh, and it is asking an impossible, it is asking Greece to uh, embark upon mission impossible. This will not happen. This, is a re this, this thing has been set up for failure. Now, can I, can I ask something before going to His Excellency? Do you think that we can devalue the euro? Don't you think that the euro is artificially high? And so if we devalue it as a, as a currency, European currency, that will change things and in Greece as well? I, I, think, I think so long as, as uh, the German policy elite and their friends are in control of European policy, there's a very good prospect of the, European, of the euro devaluing because there's a crisis of confidence in the leadership of the Eurozone, and rightly so. It's, it's entirely right that the markets should uh, desert this, uh, the Euro, given the quality of the people who control policy there. But this will not be of help to Greece, which essentially has to trade out of its problems in the European context. And a, a depreciation of the Euro will not improve Greece's competitiveness uh, with other parts of Europe. Uh, it will only improve European competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And I think there is not uh, a great prospect for this to enable uh, Greece to trade out of its problems or to create employment in the traditional German way via export-led growth. I think this is not an option that's... Because His Excellency uh, must go soon. But Can I ask you, before leaving, a question? Do you think that we need political changes in Greece? The political infrastructure of the country needs changes in order to accommodate the, the new context and the, what have... We'll see this crisis as an opportunity, as they say? Uh, certainly, uh, of course, uh, crises are to be seen as opportunities uh, for everybody, for states, and of, of course for the people, for the, for the voters, for the families, for the young generations. After all, they are the affected uh, by the crisis. Um, I think, um, let me touch upon, uh, with your permission, Professor, uh, another issue since it was mentioned before regarding the immigration. 
um, with very few words. It's a very big issue uh, in Greece, and, but of course it's a worldwide phenomenon, I may say. Um, uh, Greece uh, is, a <coughs> is a frontier country of uh, a bigger uh, free movement zone, which is called the Schengen area. Uh, so we pay the price, the price of being in the forefront of these frontiers, of common frontiers. Uh, I would like to, to highlight that uh, the numbers of, uh, the mere numbers of illegal immigrants uh, entering the Greek borders and the Schengen borders uh, is huge. It is beyond uh, essentially manageable levels. Uh, in all the senses of the, uh, of the world, uh, either economic or uh, whatever practical other dimensions may exist. It is indicative now that um, <coughs> the Greek authorities are building with their own expenses, not covered by the relevant funds devoted already, some of them, by the uh, Schengen countries uh, for keeping the frontiers uh, in a better shape of management. Uh, uh, they are trying to build uh, a fence in northern Greece of 10.2 kilometers. Uh, in the land border of 10.2 kilometers that we have with Turkey, because the, the, the main bulk of the whole, you know, uh, number of immigrants, uh, they come through the Turkish border uh, in uh, northern Greece, in, uh, in Evros River. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, an attempt to, 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 to face uh, the acute uh, um, uh, aspect of this problem that uh, has uh, reappeared in this area after um, many other attempts in other areas in uh, the Aegean. I may mention that uh, all of a sudden the Greek authorities, they found in, uninhabited Greek islands all of a sudden inhabited by illegal immigrants. Uh, so we are completely stretched out, uh, out of any uh, proportion, and uh, it is indeed a very difficult issue that should be tackled completely in common not only financially, but in every other way that uh, uh, this issue should be tackled. But of course, not only keeping the borders safe, but also treating these people in the proper way when they manage to enter in the Greek territory and in the common Schengen area of, uh, of these countries. So this is another big issue besides the other of the economic uh, crisis. Uh, certainly this crisis, of course, has uh, a Greek flavor, but uh, it was an irony that uh, uh, a minister out of, minister of finance out of even Europe, not only Eurozone, I think the Chinese one mentioned that the Greek crisis is only the tip of the iceberg and we see now the rest of the iceberg. Uh, if it was not Greece, it was a matter of time, somebody else to be there. This doesn't mean that we will not accept our own responsibilities, but our own responsibilities belong definitely to a broader context in a multiple layers of many other contexts ending up to the worldwide economy. Everything is so excessively interconnected, we may say today, in our life, not only in economic terms. Whatever happens in the oil drilling in Nigeria, for example, if there is a strike there, in a matter of seconds, because we are able to know these news in a matter of seconds, there is a practical effect to the other edge of the world. So all this in interconnectivity that we have managed should be turned in its own positive side and not only the negative effects that immediately are felt either by the people or by authorities, by whomever else. 
So everything is becoming more interrelated, more interconnected, but also at the same time more complicated. I think there are no simple answers to every, almost every problem that uh, we, are, we are called upon today to tackle and to, to deal uh, effectively. Uh, regarding uh, the Greek crisis, I have to mention that there was a contradictory, I may say, challenge dealing with time frames, very strict, and at the same time called upon to build not only legislating, but also which is the physical, let's say, dimension of legislation, which is called administrative capacity. Building administrative capacity for applying legislations and also changing mentalities by itself is time consuming. You cannot change this in a matter of a night or in one or two years. It takes time. So I think the timing aspect of the crisis is very important. Regarding all the relevant proposed solutions and ideas, it should be taken into account and should be taken also into account well ahead before. Uh, I think uh, there is already an emerging uh, I may mention even uh, worldwide, not to, to say a European-wide consensus, that the element of growth should be urgently inserted in this and also interconnected in readjusting also the timing factor. Uh, there is this broad common process, I may say, that it is in front of our eyes, of, uh, of uh, this uh, world audience. And uh, through Greece, we have already seen, and uh, let me mention the phrase, thanks to this crisis, already major and unimaginable changes, institutional already uh, thought or taking place uh, at the European Union level. Uh, of course, this is, the end of, uh, this is not the end of the road. It will take a lot of time and it will be not, a uh, not a, an easy way for everybody, uh, not only uh, for Greece. And uh, I think uh, uh, we should be able to turn this crisis and this challenge to the positive side of it. I think Greece is uh, very well positioned and there are already the seeds, although a little bit somehow still dispersed and not so well interconnected and in a systemic manner uh, mentioned or uh, uh, promoted, uh, the seeds of uh, uh, some progress and success in this very difficult and long process. So, because we are Greeks also, we have to be a little bit patient, more than the usual. <laughs> uh, I, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, whenever I meet with politicians and uh, with every other interlocutor, it is always a source of pride to know, to, 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 to be pointed out that Greeks are hard workers everywhere but not only in Australia, but also in Greece. So this myth about Greece created automatically, almost automatically, through so-called Greek crisis, or if you wish, so-called exclusive Greek crisis, is a real myth. And uh, there are statistics, not only Greek, that we are among the hardest working people worldwide. <laughs> and you're, of course, the vivid proof of this here. And thank you for uh, facilitating my own uh, mission here, because there is no need of a lot of things to be said and to prove this. Uh, but other people, they are puzzled because they, they see your performance here and in other places and they hear or they read what is written in newspapers. Of course, media 
uh, they are doing their uh, job. But whatever happened in uh, Syntagma Square or elsewhere, this is, a for, of course, the right of the people to protest. But this doesn't mean that the whole Greece is uprising, it's out of control, and everything is under fire. So Greece remains a safe country in the midst of the year of record strikes during the previous year, we received 16.5 million tourists and everybody of them returned to their country completely safe. <laughs> uh, it was 10% increase in the numbers of visitors. Greece will be beyond crisis, I may say, and beyond currencies. And this will be the case again. And uh, we should be ready for a positive surprise also from, from Greece and Greeks of Greece and Greeks abroad. Now we know that you must go. Thank you so much Thank for you. this positive and optimistic uh, 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 summation of what you said. N now we will be getting, you know, we can expand now as you see you next. Now, Maria, can I ask you something? I mean, you are one of the f policy makers of this country. Huh? <laughs> now, can we ask you, can you envisage Europe without Greece? Um, on the obvious level uh, of Greece's place and its historical significance to Europe, the answer to that is no. And I, I'm not sure that Europe itself can envisage it, Europe without Greece. So, no. Um, I have thought uh, about what it would uh, be like if Greece were to leave the Eurozone. And uh, it's obviously conversations that you have not only here in Australia, but also in Greece itself. And while on the one, there are two arguments, and it's very difficult for me, who lives here, perhaps to make an assessment. Um, are the Greeks going to be better off if they get out of the eurozone and go on their own, as the Argentinians did? And as Tony indicated, it's such a, a big ask that the answer to that may be probably no. I think it's probably in Europe's interest uh, because the Italians and the Spanish and the Portuguese are ready, willing and able to follow the Greeks, that is, their people are, so you get a domino effect that could really test Europe. Um, I think uh, Greece uh, may end up, um, in a strange sort of a way, uh, forcing Europe to make changes um, rather than only imposing changes on Greece. It actually, And we can see some signs of that already. And, and um, so, no, I think Greece is politically um, and geographically very much a part of Europe. So I can't see Greece outside <coughs> of Europe. At the end. We, yeah. Just for clarification, yeah. we talk about Greece, we talk about Germany, Italy. Can we please talk about wealthy groups and normal <coughs> people groups? So we have a bit more clarity in the discussion. Or are we saying all this is a national nationalistic, we talk about migrants being the source of the problem, which is a side issue of the extreme right. Can't we just talk about really the ordinary people, ordinary Australians, why can't ordinary Australians have Medicare, for example? Is the Labor Party, the Labor Party in Greece, PASOK has been tossed out and it's gone. Are the Labor politicians in Australia recognising that their party must come back to be a party of the people, and let's stop talking about Australians and Greeks and Germans and all this but confusion. But we're talking about the con within well, the context of the, the nation Greeks, state. I don't know who she's talking about. Is I'm it talking about... Ordinary con, Greeks I'm talking or the about, wealthy elites? No, well, I'm talking about Greece. Yeah, but I am talking about Greece. And it, it just so happens that we can talk in, you know, in, in detail about all sorts of things. But I'm talking about the Greeks in Greece, in Europe. That's who I'm talking about. And I'm just... Within the frame well, of the nation-state. Well, there are rich Greeks, state. there are poor Greeks, yeah. there are regions. If you go to the regions of we Europe... We will discuss after. No, no, no. Regional, no, no. We'll discuss and we will raise this There are regional Greeks, there are city Greeks, there are island Greeks, there are all sorts of Greeks. I'm talking about trying to get a picture about the Greeks generally. I don't believe I know enough about the Greeks and the Europeans to even offer an intelligent view about what they should be doing. Personally, I'll be honest about that. So I'm trying, in a general sense, 
just to, to be part of a conversation, because that's all we can do here, and try to enlighten people who have come here to think about Greece and Europe in a, in, in a broader way. And yes, it could be about globalisation, but it's also about the movement of people from the poor world into the Western world, and it's an issue that we have to deal with. No, I'm talking about reality on the ground. I'm no. talking about... No, I'm not saying they're the problem. No, don't misunderstand no, me. No, no, no. I'm not, not saying... Time out, time out. No, no, we have... I put it as an no. issue. Uh, can I, uh, Sophie, can I ask you something? Sure. I mean, we see these days, you know, sort of a kind of a, an explosion of interest by the media here in Australia about the Greek crisis. Some of these pr presentations are really, if I may say, strange or paradoxical or sometimes distorting. What do you think is the attitude of the political establishment in Australia towards Greece as a country itself, eh? and not as Greek or to Greek Australians? Eh? What do you think it is? Do they see Greece as a sort of the kind of the odd man of Europe? The, the, the... No, no. Uh, look, from from my experience and talking to uh, leaders from the various political parties, um, Greece uh, and the Greek people from Greece and Australian Greeks from here, whether they're second, third generation, uh, they, they um, uh, respect Greece and respect Greeks and Greek Australians. Yeah, yeah. There is a healthy, um, a healthy respect and a concern about, um, about the crisis. I mean, if, if that's what you're that's what you're... Uh, not simply about the crisis, but, you know, as you see, they have represent, presented Greeks as being lazy, as being... In terms sort of, of the media... Not working. Uh, look, I'm not going to speak... I'm not going to speak on behalf of the media. I mean, no, they've no. got their job to do and they will hold uh, political parties and governments to account and that is their job to report and to report what is going on. Um, the concern that, that I have and what has been raised with me is that there is this, this perception um, that all Greeks work from nine to midday and then they have a siesta and then and this is something that we have to debunk um, because that is not the reality. We know the reality because we have our families that live in Greece, we have our friends, we have... Uh, my dad has just gone over there uh, last week and we know how hard um, they work and we know that they work two jobs and they're caring for their families yeah, and their sick children and they have... Uh, there are so many uh, social issues there in terms of caring for their kids with disabilities, um, having operations. They've got... Uh, I was uh, uh, talking to someone who's got a family member who has ovarian cancer and they have to trans you know, pay to transport her to London. These are the, these are the, the issues, the concerns. Yeah. Before going to the uh, Q&A session, can I ask a question to all three of you because we had this issue, this concern raised. Do you think that the crisis, Professor, that we face at this moment in Greece, to a certain degree in Australia as well, is because of the neoliberal, uh, neoliberal policies that we have been implemented, destroying the welfare state, destroying, eroding all the social uh, systems of social protection that have been uh, uh, actually been achieved after the Second World War, and now we have this triumph of uh, uh, what Naomi Klein called the shock doctrine, and uh, neoliberals have taken over the Labour Party, for example, and the PASOK Party, for example, and we don't have real economic opposition, alternative, in the uh, actually conduct of economic policies of the country. Yeah, you ask a very big question. Yeah. I think that... Uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, generally true that big questions don't have simple answers and uh, I think there are many, many layers to it and I doubt that there's a, you know, there's a single thing that is the big explanator of uh, all of this. So, you know, I think in Europe at the moment we have uh, like this moral stuff that you've just been talking about, about lazy Greeks and so on and uh, all this sort of business. It's a crude kind of moral uh, diagnosis which treats a country of X million people as if they were a singular moral agent. Uh, we, we can make moral judgments about individuals who have purposes and behaviours uh, to then try to apply these moral categories that we apply to natural agents, to individual human beings, 
to whole nations of people is absolutely ludicrous. Anyone who could suppose that uh, whatever Greeks are particularly responsible for the disaster that Greece has got itself into, with some help from its creditors, uh, whatever Greeks are particularly responsible, who is prepared to stand up here and say that the suffering that's being visited on the Greek people is proportional to the contribution of those individuals to this, to this crisis? Uh, Wow, now the, the, we're becoming the, political now. The, yes, this, yes, is, yes. this is not political. This is just a, a simple analysis of the, the appropriate use of language. We cannot, we cannot apply moral categories to, to a place called Greece or a place called Germany. Yeah? It is equally foolish. Um, so th there's that layer. But l let us be clear. Uh, Protestant Europe, Protestant Europe has a conviction that that after pleasure must come suffering. <laughs> so so th th this, this is in play. This, this m mentality is in play as now, well. Before and, continuing... Uh, 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 no, I mean, I have the... Hey. Uh, we haven't recognised amongst but, us, unfortunately, so, so, that was my uh, oversight of the previous uh, Attorney General of New South Wales, Mr. Uh, John Hadzisterwos, who is here and so silently and with so much discretion is listening to us today. But he would like to say something on this. John, yes, we would like, you know, thank you. Uh, there's a microphone there, John. Standing microphone there, you know, just... You That's okay, I'll use this one. Can you hear me? I just wanted to ask the panel um, a question, if I could. Um, because a lot of the discussion has been about, about uh, concepts of lazy people and whether this is right or wrong. But it seems to me that if you look at what's happening in Greece at the moment, uh, there's a further question you need to ask yourself, and that's not only how Greece got into this situation, but how uh, it would prevent itself getting into a similar situation down the track. To what extent are the issues that Greece is confronting uh, issues of governance and poor governance? And I make that point because, as many of you would be aware, I think the panel would be aware, Roger Wilkins, who was the uh, Secretary of the Attorney General's Department, yeah. was sent by the previous Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, uh, to uh, uh, go to Greece to examine uh, the issues of governance, in particular when the um, former Prime Minister, Papandreou, was in office. And I recall having a discussion with him, and he indicated to me that even if the Prime Minister was willing to do everything that was needed to be able to resolve the issues that needed to be done, and even if there was um, a willingness on his part to do it, he wouldn't have the capacity to be able to do it because of the structures uh, of Greek government. And so I want a comment from the panel in relation to that. And if uh, issues of governance are central to the solution of this crisis and prevention of future crises of a similar nature, um, what is the way forward, bearing in mind that the Greek people themselves have rejected the status quo through the recent election? Now, the Consul General is not here at the moment to give us a, a definitive answer on the problem. Maria, what do you think? I think there is a, an issue with governance, and I think it's widely known that there is an issue with governance. Accountability and processes, and decision-making processes in particular, are very ad hoc and difficult to follow through in Greece. Uh, from my own experience, just in my own meetings with ministers and departments, so they, their attitude in terms of ideas and following things through are very, very different to the way ours would be here. And yes, you're right, Australia has lent assistance in even helping the Papandreou government set up a cabinet structure, which they didn't have prior to him going into the... So you can imagine that they're contemplating... They were contemplating a cabinet process, you know, three years ago only. So you can imagine what, what had been going on before that. I don't know enough about the governance of Greece to be able to offer a definitive answer, but generally, yes, and the Greek people themselves who up until recently more or less just took it for granted that their politicians were corrupt, that nepotism and uh, vote buying was par for the cause. That's the political culture that seems to be talked about widely. 
Whose fault is it that that culture developed? Um, Greece prides itself in being a democracy, and in many ways it is. It's probably got legislation in, in place that may be more democratic than some of ours here. But the truth is that there is a, there's a certain malaise about the way politicians governed and decisions were made generally, which probably did lead to an inability to even collect tax. Their entire tax structure was not only non-existent, it was completely not implemented. And so it has serious structural problems in that sense. And correcting those is probably one practical way of finding its way forward. Um, so the stereotypes on the one hand are frivolous, but on the other, it, did ha it does have some serious governance problems. That it's one of the reasons why um, both major parties copped such a, uh, a whipping in the election. And it's one of, while I was there, Akis Dokhazopoulos, the former defence minister and star of the um, Andreas Papandreou era, was put in jail. So was his wife and so was his daughter. That was the intrigue that led into the election on that Sunday and for, procure, you know, for, for bribes and, and allegations, the sorts of things that do not happen in this country, that sort of political interest. No, 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 not to such an extent. No, no, Eleni, uh, sorry, Eleni, Eleni wanted to say something. Sorry. Hi. Now, Eleni wants to say something, we will discuss that, Eleni, yeah. I'm speaking on behalf of the We Are All Greek Sydney campaign, yes. which is a solidarity campaign with the Greek people. Uh, I just wanted to say that from talks I have had with people in Greece and from uh, one Mr. Karalambidis, who was the actual person who wrote a book for, called A Vision for Greece that Basok first used in the 70s when they first set up. Unfortunately, by 1981, he'd already lost hope with Basok. In that book, he had a system for um, building infrastructure for Greece, changing Greek government, uh, and we know that Greece has always had a problem with governments, and what Karalambidis says, and what I personally believe, is that Greece has never had proper political governments. What it has had is, is soccer club mentality, and if you belong to the Greens, you vote Green, you're a soccer, like soccer fans. And so there's never been a responsible government, and without a responsible government, there cannot be responsible citizens. The citizens do the best they can in a situation where the tax system is no good, there's so much corruption, uh, it's human nature to want to survive. So if you have to, you know, not pay your full taxes to survive, that's what you're going to do. But the same thing that the people did there is happening here in Australia. We do the same thing here. Not everyone here pays all their taxes. And as we know, I think it's a, a bit of a class system where the upper classes don't pay their taxes and the working class always does. And the ones who are suffering in Greece now are the working class. So that's very true. And what was actually addressed, what John said and Maria, is that it's a systemic problem with the government uh, sort of a, a function in Greece. Eh? And it happens, if I may say, since 1981. Uh, the, our beloved uh, socialist leader, Andreas Papandreou, introduced all these incredible you know, ideas of uh, nepotism, favoritism, clientelism. As long as you voted for the party, you were a member of, uh, you were appointed in the government. And of course, something continued by the uh, New Democracy Party, who, up, who actually gave tenure in as late as 2006 to 150,000 casual workers to the state. After the debacle of the Olympics, after all these incredible deficits that we were actually in, the, in, in uh, the atmosphere, you can see in the horizon, and after repeated letters by the finance minister to the prime minister, Mr. Karamanlis, who said, uh, we don't have time to deal with these issues. And you remember Mr. Karamanlis in 2006, 2007 here, spending $10 million simply to be filmed by the cranes of Channel 6 and Channel 7 for his uh, electoral campaign. So I think that there is what uh, Tony said before, there is a problem with the political elite in Greece. Don't you think, Tony? What do you think about this strange political elite that... Uh, Look, I, I'm, uh, I've followed the economics uh, very closely over the last few years, but 
I'm not an expert on Greek politics, uh, but it seems to me clear that there's something very rotten uh, with the structure of Greek politics. Um, but the, the, the point I would make is this. It's clear that governance has to be clean, cleaned up and obviously PASOK and New Democracy have failed. So, so, so the, the left and uh, this, the Nazis uh, are filling a vacuum which is created by PASOK and New Democracy. It's PASOK and New Democracy that are responsible for this, this most recent election result. Now the, the European Union is trying to bully the Greeks to go back and vote for the, the, uh, the people who will do what uh, the European wants them to do. Uh, this is what's going on. But the one thing I would emphasise is this. The, the financial architecture of the European Union needs fixing. This is not just about Thanks. Greece. So, so there is a, excuse me, because Maria has to go as well, there's a question there, Professor Paxinos. It works. Uh, the, reasons the, the reason the dinosaurs died is that they refused to get into Noah's Ark unless Tsipras got in there as well. <laughs> I just went to Greece and uh, voted uh, against those two parties that you mentioned that brought uh, Greece to its knees. I looked at countless windows on television, like your panel here, and I never heard uh, two of the factors that I think uh, can contribute in the country getting back in its, uh, uh, on its feet. And just wonder, in the top 20 items that you'd think a country should do, governance and all that, wouldn't there be somewhere some attention to medical issues in Greece? Uh, on the road, you have the terrorists and the terrorized. And I am terrorized when I uh, drive in Greece. And uh, you have uh, 3,000 people dying on the road. The country educated them and then they die. That capital is lost. Even worse, 7,000 people who are handicapped in the country has to support them, support them up to now. And from now on, if you add that, this one million uh, per person, that is the uh, euros per person, if you uh, multiply uh, the 3,000 by seven, which is seven people uh, handicapped for everyone dead, you find that there are 24,000 altogether that are lost. That's $24 billion a year. Now, you might say, we well, will not bring it down to zero, but you can bring to some manageable level. And if you add smoking to that, you find that the whole debt can be paid by 30 years of reducing that cost. I never heard anybody say that. Well, very good. That's a statement as well. Anna wanted to say ask something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we take it as a comment. Get I just get a <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the panel because your views are very clear. And I think, although you're not uh, from Greece like I am, and Vasidas, um, you have a very good understanding of what's going on in my country at the moment. What we all have to understand is that these are two separate issues we're talking about tonight. Um, corruption in Greece and poor governance and uh, inefficiency, I would say, more than anything, has been happening in Greece uh, since I can remember. Since I, I left Greece when I, I was 26, uh, a few years ago, 15 years ago, and uh, things were exactly the same back then as they are now. Um, what I'm saying is that, for example, the, the Greek debt was 110% of the GDP since 1993. All of a sudden, it becomes a problem now. I think this is the question we have to focus on, that there is corruption in Greece, and there has been corruption in Greece, and not only in Greece, in Italy too. Italy, there is a mafia, but for, for example, no one is talking about it. Um, so yes, Spain, either, Ireland, no one is talking about, about that. Um, my issue is what Professor Tony mentioned before, is the lack of proportion. What is happening? Uh, focusing in Greece and uh, the huge propaganda and the attack against my country and the humiliation that my country and, and, and the people are suffering at the moment is beyond proportion. And the vulgarity of the Western uh, countries attacking my country. And I have heard in BBC World that, uh, oh, well, we, if we can sell the Parthenon, we can pay the debt. And this is by professional journalists saying these things. Right. 
this is, is um, it's going out of control, and I haven't seen any politicians, apart from Tsipras, actually, who did, who did put it in a, in a very good way and says, no, it's not a Greek problem, it's a European problem, by the way. Um, it was about time someone uh, put it in its uh, real, um, uh, gave its real meaning. It's not a Greek problem, it's a European problem. No politician ever, uh, Greek politician ever stopped to say, what's going on? Why is it just Greece? Why are you focusing on Greece? Why are you bringing Greece down? And uh, this is affecting not just Greece, it's affecting, uh, it's affecting the tourism, it's affecting, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's bringing a very bad reputation to the whole of the country. Yes, I will stop for a second, don't worry. About yeah, that. yeah, you must. Yeah, yes, thank thanks. you. Thank you. I mean, it's a, it's a very important issue, you know. I mean, as you see, the reactions as we see here is because Greeks feel humiliated in the most obscene and I would... Sorry? It was a statement. It was an st explosion of statement. You know, just you know. Now we have uh, another question. You know, we have uh, Maria has to leave now. So, do we have any questions specifically for Maria? Yeah, that would be good. No, Yo, who, who who wants to ask? You know, <laughs> no. Yanni, Yanni, there, yay. Hello. Yeah, it is. Hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, address uh, Professor Paxinos's point about the road toll. Um, in fact, because of the economic recession, the road toll has gone down below 1,500 uh, in Greece at the moment. So the road toll has fallen because nobody can afford to drive. <laughs> no, no, so, question. But yep. the question I want yep. to direct is to the, professor, the um, economist on the panel. Uh, as a fellow economist, I would like to say that, ask you if the rise of China is not only... Um, the problem of Greece, but it's actually the whole existential challenge to the economy of the entire European Union. And I don't think a lot of the Europeans have quite come to terms with the rise of China and the fact that the terms of trade, the fact that the yuan is so artificially low, which has helped the Chinese accumulate a surplus of two to three trillion dollars. That's 2,000 to 3,000 billion dollars. Um, I would like to ask that to the economist. Thank you, Yanni. Short I, professor. I, w I wouldn't sort of naturally bring China into the equation. I think that uh, the European Union, uh, the Eurozone is roughly in external balance. This means that, that, that uh, the Eurozone is capable of funding all of the deficits uh, of the Eurozone with surpluses from other parts of the Eurozone. The, the picture of European politicians going with their begging bowl to China is pathetic and unnecessary. So it's a failure of intellect and imagination. It's not due to really objective constraints that Europe faces, I think. So, I'm a bit sceptical, really, but, you know, I could be wrong. I, I, I wouldn't be dogmatic about that. Question. Yes, um, I'd also like to say, what is <coughs> Question to Maria, address, Maria, because she's living. Well, Maria, I would like to ask you a question, but I'm going to lose my opportunity of asking another oh. one. <laughs> Sorry, um, just am I allowed to ask two little ones? No, OK. One I've short. Now, can we have a question for Maria? All right, know, Maria, just, you know. all right. My question for Maria, and I'll come back to the, on to the economy, is, Maria, you, you said um, that it's actually... You commented by saying it's sad that the Greeks have left the normal in po politics by moving to the extremes. Um, I, I, I take some... Um, I, uh, I take some exception. not... Exception. Exception to that, because... Um, I, th I think that that in, in some ways says that the Greeks are not able to understand their own situation. And I think they're, they're saying very much that what we, we even in Australia call the normal, the two-party lib lab thing, has failed them. And, and not only has failed them, has taken, has taken its opportunity to... Um, to, now I don't want to use a too strong word here, to, take, to enrich it themselves by their two-party swapping over of power. 
yeah? And we're seeing those things happening in Australia as well. So I think it's very, and I'd like to, for you to comment on why you think that it's normal to only vote PASOK or Neo Democratia, and why you think that if you vote an alternative that that's an extreme. I think that's a myth, and I think that vote, voting for... I, I personally would never vote for a fascist party, but I would vote for somebody who was representing my interests on, and who, who could give me solutions. I don't think there's the okay. normal oh, in we that sense. We must answer. I, I we actually... Must answer. Now, Maria, you must answer, and then Sophie well, wants to say well, something. I, I don't think I think any of the things that you just said you thought I thought. It sounds like Romsfeld, I think. Um, no, I said it's, what I meant was it was sad to see a, a nation of people that I know very well because I've observed over a period of time who are very politically engaged and have a view about a lot of things move their political views on this occasion between the centre group of apathy and complete disillusionment and then the two extremes. Uh, I think it is sad that the Greeks opted to vote for a neo-Nazi party because uh, they blamed the illegal immigrants. Um, that's, that, that, narrative, that narrative resonated with young people. I actually think that is sad for a country that's, that uh, considers itself to be a great lover of freedom and democracy. So yes, it is sad. And on the other hand, it's also sad. Well, I didn't say they were normal. Didn't I didn't say that. that. And Greece is not a two-party system. It never has been. Australia is predominantly a two-party system. But Greece has not been a two-party system. Greece is a country that's had a number of parties. If anything, what is it? A three or four-party system. No. It's the extremities that people get pushed to that I said was sad. Um, I didn't say and it didn't mean any of the other things. Well, I also think the extreme left isn't useful either. This is not a left and right paradigm, and I'm going to leave it at that. I think the whole concept of what's going on in Europe needs a different thinking, and it probably is about the European Union, and it probably is about... Uh, I struggle to understand the European Union and how it operates, and it probably is an overinflated bureaucracy that's spending a lot of money. It probably is all those things. And believe it or not, those conversations are being had in Europe, and they're being had... In, in homes in Greece itself. I mean, so what I will leave you on is this. It strikes me, a lot of people in this country think the Greeks, all those things, but also, oh, look at these people, they're so destructive. They're turning against themselves and they're, you know, they're, they're demonstrating. I think a lot of those people actually believe genuinely that they are resisting and leading a, a, a resistance against globalisation and the corporate world. And in that sense, they're more astute and more switched on than even the debate that we're having here. It's, it's an interesting area that we need to develop. And, and you can't do it in five minutes. But, Sophie, you want to add so, something? <laughs> Look, I, I just wanted to, um, to add, and, and I agree with what Maria is saying, but um, it, is the, it is the desperation, it is the pressure that people are feeling. They're feeling let down by the, what we say, the, the major parties. Um, and if I'm, I, I draw a comparison, and um, not to say that my, my party in New South Wales, the Labor Party, um, suffered a major loss. And that, is, and, and that was stated by uh, our leader at the time, that um, we weren't responsive to the people and we had let the people down. And it's uh, happened in Queensland. And it is about bringing that balance back. It is about having the major parties, the Labor Party, Liberal, well, my party, the Labor Party, um, being a, a, a party that is of the centre, um, that is a party of, uh, uh, of, of jobs, of uh, economic growth. And my concern is that when you don't have um, the different views of the major parties and people feel um, that they have to go to um, the extreme right or the extreme left to have their voice heard, um, that is a, it is a concern and it is the responsibility of those major parties to improve in the way um, they formulate their policies, in their responses to the community, in engaging with the community, because the concern, and we've seen this, is we, and look, we're seeing it in Queensland, where they don't have an upper house. There's seven Labor MPs out of the, the uh, 89 uh, lower house members, and it's roughshod 
you know? And um, so anyway, sorry, I'll... Now, we, we, you are the only politician left among us. Sorry. So I think now, you know, <laughs> there is one question there and one question there and we are sorry. done. You know, just... No, uh, I have a quick question. Uh, quick, very quick. For the remainder of the panel. Um, we're seeing in Greece a rise of populism again on both sides, but predominantly in the left with Syriza and uh, the... Uh, the rise of Tsipras, which sounds a lot like the old Adrea Papadreou used to sound in the 80s. However, if, if uh, Syriza, which is a real possibility of getting in and, and forming a government, were to get in and they were to apply their policies in Greece, what, in the panel's opinion, would happen? Uh, <laughs> Tony. <laughs> Now, well, I don't please think answer that. because I don't we are running late and we'll be kicked you know, out of this place. Yeah. I don't know why they, I don't know why they called extreme left. They're just uh, the vague left, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you have to tell me what these policies are because I'm yet to read these policies. <laughs> Look, I, I tell you, I tell you, I'll give you just a personal response. If I had a vote, I would vote for them, and I and I would vote for them. Because, because they're not prepared to be the bum boys of the European Union. Wow. Final question, yes. because unfortunately we'll have the opportunity to meet the two speakers afterwards. Now, uh, Thank you. I'll address my question to shortly. the economist professor on the panel, as he's not linked to the Labour Party, I think, not in any way on the panel. Um, um, I question very much um, the sense of the policy makers that are putting in place the austerity measures. I'm also part of the We Are All Greek Sydney campaign, who are actively <laughs> campaigning um, uh, amongst other things, against these austerity measures. Now, in all good economic common sense, if that can all, at all be possible, l politics aside, what is driving this madness of the austerity measures, given that it's sending Greece back into the dark ages without any plans for growth, infrastructure, no way of funding all of this, let alone the refugees that are uh, pouring through? What is driving the policy makers in the European Union that Stiglitz and Schiller have commented endlessly, you know, this is a suicide pact for the EU, is driving them to this madness and therefore blaming us and destroying the EU in the process, but blaming Greece as the catalyst? You must uh, give an answer. Tony, no, you have given you an answer. No, no, that's no, right. You wanted him to answer. No, we want you to answer as a political. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. No, but the lady said that she didn't want to. She didn't want me to answer. <laughs> Never mind. That's why you must answer. You know that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> now we have discussed about this issue. We don't have. It. Now, what do you think? Is this Greece at this moment is forced by Europe to follow this program? Don't they have uh, any national or moral or existential resistances to this um, austerity measures? Uh, enforced upon them from the outside? Look, they're, they're in a... Uh, Do politicians succumb to pressures? Absolutely, yeah, well, they, they do, they do. Do you think that this is the case now in Greece? Well, I mean, we're, they're going back to an election now and the people are, I mean, the people are gonna have to make a very big decision and um, following what each party is saying at the moment, I mean, there's all the the, the rhetoric that's going on. Um, the Europeans are putting on enormous pressure and going out there and campaigning in the in the local areas to ensure that they get their their um, party up. Um, but we need to see. I mean, the, it's it's going to be. Um, interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. And my concern is that there won't be. A, a definite outcome. That's the concern. Now, I would like to thank our all, spe all our speakers tonight. Sorry, this gentleman. Uh, uh, Tony, Sorry. you want to answer? Yes. You gave uh, an answer already. No. The, oh, yeah. You see, look, the short answer, I think, would be uh, to say two things. One, if, if, if you have these people who, with power who are making policy and you say to yourself, you convince yourself that what they're proposing is insane, and doesn't work, then you have to conclude that they're either stupid or they're malicious. Or they're gaining 
or, or some combination of the two. Now, all of the theories from the people that I think are rational, whether they're centrist people like Paul Krugman, Joe Stiglitz, or people further left, they're going to boil down to some combination of saying the Germans are stupid or malicious. That's what it's going to come to. The second point I would make is that, that I think the clearest view of these matters uh, can be found uh, on the website of my uh, longtime friend and former uh, colleague at the University of Sydney, Yanis Varoufakis, yeah. who, uh, <laughs> who taught at this university for uh, 10 years, in fact, until about 2000. And, uh, and I think he's been the clearest voice throughout, throughout these uh, problems and remains the clearest voice and has been largely vindicated as events have developed. Now, after this, I think that was a definite answer. This wraps up all our discussion tonight. We have uh, another 20 minutes if you want to meet uh, Sophie and Tony and discuss with them personally. Sophie, thank you so much for finding oh, the time. This is, good. This is great. Yes. We should meet. <laughs> we should. Yeah. Yes, I think Sophie. I was going to say, this is a very important dialogue and it's important that we continue this conversation um, uh, over the next uh, few um, months. It's very important and, and for us to keep that, that network and engage and be, um, be practical in what ideas or what outcome you want from this um, process. First of all, I would like to thank both of thank you, you and the others who are not here, <laughs> Professor Regal and... Uh, John Hadzistegos and all of you, of course, for being here tonight and uh, for your passion and, and your enthusiasm. Yes, thank you. <laughs>